I'm Brian Houston, and I am with Kelly Hitchcock, a certified professional trainer, a physical trainer, also a owner and operator of KH Fitness in Tyler, Texas. Uh, Kelly and I do a weekly podcast talking about fitness and health, and uh, we talk about some of the topical things that have come down in the news over the last few days. And, and for instance, just in the last 24 hours, uh, we get this uh, story from the World Health Organization uh, recommending that your daily sugar intake should be just 10 percent of your total calories. Uh, Kelly, what's your reaction to that first of all? Well, 10 percent of our total calories is, is it's a very minimal amount and I think that that should be our long-term goal. Maybe in the short term we should maybe look with a personal trainer and figure out what amount we're taking in right now and probably cut that in half because probably the average person is consuming anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of their total intake from simple sugars. Okay. And so what, you know, I think, you know, let's just say it's, if it's 30%, then maybe let's cut that to 15% of our total caloric intake. And again, those numbers get kind of confusing for most, but if you can get with a, a nutritionist or a trainer and maybe keep a food log and bring that in and let them work with you on that. Some of the stats on this thing, uh, the World Health Organization says, according to um, the, their studies, an, an average diet, uh, someone eating 2,000 calories a day, I should say, that American consumes an average of 15% of daily calories from added sugars. First of all, how many people in this country really on a 2,000 calorie diet? Yeah, not many. Uh, I mean, 2,000 calories is probably what a, an athletic 130 to 140 pound woman would be consuming. So if you're someone who weighs, I'd say 180 pounds up over 200 pounds, you're probably consuming anywhere between 25 to 3,000 calories per day. Okay, and then obviously 15% of that being sugar, that seems extremely low as well. If you're average, if you're consuming over 3,000 calories a day, right? That that would bump the numbers up. I mean, they they've done studies as far as people that are self-reporters, meaning that I come to you and I say, how many calories a day do you think you're consuming? Uh, the one thing that they noticed among most people is that we, we overestimate our caloric expenditure and we way underestimate our caloric intake. You know, we all think we're burning a lot more calories than we are and we all think we're eating a lot less than we are. And we can go on forever and chase a rabbit here just talking about how, much, how many calories we think we're burning based on the amount of sweating we're doing. Sure, I think a lot of us, we, we mistake sweat for uh, effort or for caloric expenditure. And that's just not the case. The sweat is just more indicative of clo cl uh, cooling down your body. All right, let's talk about the, uh, the problem, first of all. The World Health Association going after trying to reduce your uh, amount of sugar that you take into your diet right now. What are the problems that uh, are caused by excessive uh, sugar intake and obviously obesity being the, the biggest factor? I mean, anybody would know that. But uh, what other problems are we talking about here uh, when you take in more sugar than you should? Probably the main concern is, is the diabetes uh, epidemic that we're facing right now. Uh, if you look at the amount of diabetics, there's basically 5% of the U.S. diabetics are type 1. Now, type 1 is an issue of your pancreas where it's not producing on its own enough insulin uh, to shuttle the food to uh, sites so that it can be utilized for fuel. 95% uh, uh, of Americans, it, which used to be known as adult onset type 2, now has gone back to just being top, called top 2. And that's because we're seeing such an incredible rate of children spilling over into this category. And top two is when uh, we're consuming so much food and, sh and a lot of sugar that we cannot keep up insulin production to shuttle that food to the storage sites. So that's when people have to get on insulin to try to help control that blood sugar. And that's, that's a big problem. Okay. And, and we'll look at the, uh, the risks that are involved with uh, having too much sugar, including uh, uh, diabetes, including uh, obesity. We're also talking about heart disease. Uh, we're talking about high blood pressure, uh, risk factors for heart disease and stroke. Uh, all that tied in with, uh, with being overweight. Sure, even orthopedic problems. When you start looking at people that are overweight, uh, you start to have joint issues. Uh, as you mentioned with the cardiovascular type issues, uh, having high blood sugar in the bloodstream and your arteries for a significant uh, period of time uh, creates vascular damage. And so there's a lot of factors that go in uh, and there's a lot of concerns that we should have, especially with our children. Uh, the largest increase in, in type 2 diabetes percentage-wise is in five to six-year-olds. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's a big problem, and it's going to probably be a problem that uh, follows these kids throughout their adult life. All right, what is the main culprit for a five- to six-year-old child? Why are they uh, taking in so much more uh, sugar now than they were 25 years ago? What is it that they're, what's, what's the uh, poison bullet there? I think, I think you have to look at the availability. Uh, it's just so av readily available. If you look at the way the TV markets sports drinks, I mean, you have kids that don't even play sports that are walking around drinking Gatorade, Powerade, and these are products that are loaded with salt and sugar, which that's great if you're exercising and it's 100 degrees outside and you need to replace those electrolytes. But what we're really looking at is a lot of kids that are just sitting on the couch. They have a very sedentary lifestyle and they're consuming these drinks that are really high in sugar. Uh, also, you know, we just have these big, the, 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 uh, the, the amount of Cokes, you know, used to we had a can, now we have liters or two liters. I mean, they're getting larger. Uh, when you go to any of your convenience store, uh, there's incentives to buy the big one because you can bring that cup back in and get a free refill. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about 32 to 64 ounces of, of a uh, soft drink as opposed to what used to be an eight ounce can of Coke. Oh, sure. You know, when we were little, we probably might have had one, maybe two cans per day, even if that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you're right. One serving now could be as big, large as 64 ounces. That's crazy. Um, uh, the other thing uh, we were talking about, uh, what else is it that, that, that kids are consuming right now? I mean, automatically you would, you would look at candy and say, okay, that must be the main culprit. Is that it? Or is it the, is it the soft drinks and, and the uh, Powerades and Gatorade, things like that? I, I think number one is the, is the drinks, and that's something that's really easy to cut down on. Uh, number two, I think, is the amount of processed foods that we're eating. Uh, usually they're really high in, in salt again and sugar. They, those usually are paired together. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because they have addictive properties. And a lot of the food companies know that. So it's in their best interest to really load up our food with sugar and salt. We have a po positive neurological response anytime we are presented with sugar and salt, and fat for that matter. Uh, but if you look at a lot of the, uh, the pastry type foods that we eat, uh, they're cheap, they're abundant, and they're completely legal. Uh, you look at, you know, it's cheaper to feed our kids white bread. Uh, a, lo a lot of the kids' lunches are, are processed foods. So all of those things are really, really loaded with sugar. Okay. And, and you just mentioned, I'll go back to it real quickly, uh, the fact that a lot of times the things that we think are good for us, that, are, are, that might be good for our health, like sports drinks, Gatorade, Powerade, you know, you associate that with exercising. While we're not exercising, we take, we take that in. What are some other uh, uh, foods and drinks that we might be taking in thinking that they're good for us, but actually they could be the kinds of things that, are, that could kill us? Well, you, you know, you, we, we go in and have a glass of tea. You know, sometimes we go to our local sandwich shop and, you know, we don't realize that there's about 10 teaspoons of sugar that are in some of our teas. Uh, at late at night after a meal, we have that glass of wine because we've heard that it's heart healthy. Mm -hmm. When in reality, it's four ounces that they're talking about. And I, I rarely know anyone who drinks only four ounces of wine. And usually that wine is paired with a real fatty meal. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is with that real high blood sugar from that wine, that's helping to shuttle the fat that's in that meal that we just ate late at night when we're about to lay down and go to sleep. We're shuttling that fat into the fat stores. And um, there, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of things. Uh, we drink lemonade, you know, we may think that that's okay for us, but we, we fail to check the sugar content. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy if you look at any of the labels on these drinks, you'll have a carbohydrate uh, reading and you'll also have a sugar reading. Let's just say that it ha a drink has 30 grams of carbohydrates with uh, 30 grams of sugar. That means every bit of the carbohydrate that you're drinking in that drink is coming from sugar. Okay, so what you want to look for is maybe a drink that has 30 grams of carbohydrates with only two to three grams of sugar. That way you know that that type of carbohydrate is okay to eat. We've kind of, with carbohydrates, we've thrown the baby out with the bath water. We, we, carbohydrates have been villainized as being the bad macronutrient. When in reality, it needs to compose a, at least 60% of our caloric intake. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is, is we we're so fearful of sugar now that we've just kind of thrown away all carbohydrates. And so it's really, really important to, when you're eating anything, even whole wheat bread has got a bad rap. I mean, there's nothing wrong with whole wheat bread. You just want to make sure that when you look on the label that the majority of the carbohydrates are coming from complex rather than from simple sugars. 
I'm a guy, I never have been a big eggs and bacon guy. I like it, but I just never have eaten a lot of it for breakfast. It's usually been a bowl of cereal, okay? Uh, I was just reading here yesterday and, and getting ready for this thing that they, they, the amount of sugar in even cereals that you don't think have a whole lot of sugar in it, things like Raisin Bran or, you know, the, the things where you think you're doing yourself some good by eating whole grains, but there, there's a lot of sugar in something like that too. Oh, there's a lot of special K, you know, unless you get the high protein special K. Uh, Cheerios, if you get frosted shredded wheat or frosted Cheerios, they're going to be really, really high in sugar. Uh, so it's very, very important that we read the labels. You know, as you mentioned, the, the raisin bran, I mean, we think of bran, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a fiber. So it's got to be healthy. But you're right, what they do is they coat it with a layer of sugar. And so it's a way of kind of tricking us, I guess you would say, and to think that we're doing something healthy or rationalizing that we're doing, doing something healthy. But in reality, it is loaded with sugar, so it's very important to read the labels. And, and I was reading the labels, and in reading this article, it mentioned that uh, one way, one guideline might be that in a serving of a particular cereal, you wanted to make sure that the uh, the amount of sugar in it uh, was equal to or less than 10 grams of sugar in a serving of that cereal, as opposed to where it might be in the 30s. Right, exactly. Like like I said, if it's if it's let's just say it's got 30 grams of sugar, mm -hmm. take 30 times. Uh, let's say 20% and make sure that number is below, mm -hmm. uh, make sure that, well, the number that you get is, it, it make sure it's below 20%. And, and one of the other areas where I make a mistake all the time is I like to have raisins on my, sugar, right. on my cereal. Well, I looked at the sugar content of a serving of raisins, which is probably just the size of the palm of your hand, I guess, 29 grams of sugar in raisins. And you're thinking, well, that, that was a, one source of fruit. That you so you thinking okay I'm doing something good here, and then I'm not right. Well, you know th that's important to look at. I mean, you know raisins are healthy. There's there's a lot of iron. There's a lot of uh, important uh, essential vitamins and minerals in raisins. Uh, there's a lot of vitamins and minerals in a banana. Uh, what you're doing is when when they look at when when you're looking at fruit, uh, you really we, we've been told that the glycemic index comes into play, mm -hmm. and that. We want to eat things that are lower on the glycemic index. And so most of our fruits have been excluded from that, uh, which they shouldn't be. One way that you can get around the glycemic index, and that goes for any of our, our foods. It could be rice, oatmeal, raisins, like you said, or bananas. The way that you cut that glycemic index in half is by combining a protein with it. Okay, so, so never have a handful of raisins. Never have a banana. Okay, what you want to do is maybe throw a banana in your protein shake. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe have some, uh, a handful of raisins mixed, or not a handful, excuse me, but a small box. There's a really small box. I think it's about two to three ounces. Buy them like that. That way it prevents you from just grabbing a handful. Okay. So do a small box of raisins. Maybe put that in with your, uh, your Cheerios, the whole wheat Cheerios, and do skim milk. Mm -hmm. So since we've added some protein with that, that carbohydrate, it cuts the glycemic index in half. I mean, that's the way we recommend eating all of our meals. Like, we recommend things like baked potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice, whole wheat bread, uh, oatmeal. And a lot of people, like, like, they cringe when they hear us talking about that because they've been told to stay away from anything white. Mm -hmm. And that's just a simplistic way of trying to keep you from eating things uh, without having to really go into detail and explaining why you shouldn't. When in reality, a, a baked potato is fine. You just want to have your baked potato with a chicken breast or you want to have it with a piece of fish. And when we combine the protein and the carbohydrates together, what you're doing is you're helping to cut that blood sugar in half, and it helps to release the sugar into the bloodstream at a slower rate, which is really what we're after. Our body can handle that type of sugar a little bit easier by releasing insulin and then, and then shuttling it to the sites where it's needed. All right. Now, talking a little bit about some of the science involved in here, um, I hear the phrase simple sugar. And what, a complex sugar? Is that right? What's, a, what's the difference? Simple sugar versus a complex carbohydrate. Okay. A simple sugar is going to be a, a, a monosaturide, a single uh, cell sugar molecule. Okay. What that means is it, it hits the bloodstream quick and uh, it increases the blood sugar really fast. And when that happens, our body responds, our pituitary sends a message to the, uh, the, uh, the, the kidneys to release insulin. And then it's got to shuttle that blood sugar out of the bloodstream quick. When you eat a complex carb, and that might be brown rice or baked potato, sweet potato, the, the sugar is released slower into the bloodstream. Okay. And so we just have to release a little bit of insulin. Now, 
if you combine that protein, it even makes it even go in slower, okay. which we just don't have. We are, it's not taxing our, our kidneys to, to release that insulin. And it handles it a lot better. If you flood the, the, the bloodstream with a simple sugar, you release a ton of insulin to clear that. And what will happen is, is if your muscles are saturated with gly glycogen or carbohydrates, then it just shuttles it right into the fat stores. And that's what we don't want to do. You have three storage sites. You have the muscle, you have the, the liver, and you have the fat cells. Once the muscle and liver are full, then the next site available is the fat cell. We, really, we do a really good job of growing that part of it then, right? We, we do, and we eat, and we don't do anything. So what happens is neither one, all three of those tanks never become empty. So when you keep eating and that blood sugar has nowhere to go, what we do is our fat, there's a term called hyperplasia. That fat cell actually splits off and forms another fat cell so that we have extra room to handle all this excessive calories coming in. And that's when you start to see people getting up to four to five to 600 pounds. All right, so you're telling me you, that when we eat a simple sugar, we need to combine it with something, with protein, with some kind of carb, some, some kind of balance to slow down the the speed at which the uh, insulin, uh, uh, which shuttles the body it. shuttles it. Okay, so then if that's being the case, then why is the low-carb diet so popular where you see people trying to eliminate uh, bread, potatoes, uh, anything other than, you know, m meat and I, I guess fruit or whatever else. Sure. Well, the, the reason why it's so popular is because of the quick weight loss. Uh, unfortunately, we gauge our success by the scales. And really, that number is very misleading because when we lose weight, we have no clue if we're losing fat, muscle, water. We just have no clue. So what happens when you eliminate carbohydrates or you minimize the amount of carbohydrates? You have to understand that for every one gram of carbohydrate we eat, we hold three grams of fluid, of water, okay? And, and typically that's stored in the muscle. Now keep in mind, 70% of our muscle weight is water weight, okay? So we want to hold water in the muscle. Mm -hmm. So when you eliminate that carbohydrate, you can't hold water, okay? Because there's no carbohydrate molecules for the water to attach to. So what happens is we're eating and we're drinking, we're eating protein and we're drinking fluid, but we're just urinating that fluid right out. It's like a diuretic. So we're, we're just flushing ourselves. We're actually dehydrating ourselves of water. So we go and get on the scales and we've lost eight pounds and we're just so excited. We, we think that that's fat loss, but it's really just water. Okay. So now after about a day or day and a half of restricting our car carbohydrates, now we go into what's called ketosis. Now, we read part of the definition of ketosis, where the ketosis, in the absence of carbohydrates, fat is burned for fuel. Okay, well, that, if, if that was true, then that would be great. The problem is, is if you read the, 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 uh, the definition of ketosis, it's the incomplete breakdown of fatty acids for fuel. What's actually happening is you're burning at an equal rate 50% muscle and 50% fat. So the, let's just say someone loses... 10 pounds. You basically have lost five pounds of water, two pounds of fat, two and a half pounds of fat, and two and a half pounds of muscle. Now, every time you lose muscle, you're losing your metabolism. You're burning less, you're burning fewer and fewer calories. So by losing two pounds of muscle, you've basically just lowered your resting metabolic rate by 100 calories a day. And this cycle continues. And what will happen is we keep going and we keep going and we keep losing more fat, more muscle, what you're setting yourself up for is to be a great fat store because there's only going to be a certain amount of time you can continue to, to deprive yourself of carbohydrates. So what happens is when we introduce them back into our diet, there's an overcompensation. We store extra carbohydrates. And the main reason why we do that, well, number one is because we deprived ourselves, but number two, we've lost a lot of muscle mass and our metabolic rate has slowed down. So now we kind of hear people say, I blew up, I blow up. And yeah, you are blowing up. You're holding extra carbs. And with those extra carbs, you're holding extra water. So the thing that is so attractive about the low-carb diet, I guess you would say, is the initial w weight loss. People really perceive that they're losing fat. In reality, you're losing fat and muscle, and you're slowing down your metabolic rate. And eventually, you're going to put all that weight on back on plus more. Just a matter of time. Okay, you know, our brain runs strictly on glucose. It runs on carbohydrate. Okay, so... 
when we, when we uh, eliminate those carbohydrates or lower those carbohydrates, the brain senses that. It's like, oh, you know, I mean, if the brain could talk, which it can't, obviously, but if it could, it would say, hey, I need sugar and I need it quick. So what the brain does, it releases, it triggers the pituitary gland to release cortisol. Cortisol is a catabolic hormone. And catabolic means to break down. So when the brain is low on sugar, it triggers cortisol. When cortisol is released, it goes to the muscle and it breaks down our muscle tissue to provide sugar for our brain. It's a lot easier to break down muscle and convert it into sugar than it is to break down fat and convert it into sugar. And the breaking down of uh, a non-carbohydrate source into sugar is called gluconeogenesis. It's the creation of new blood sugar from a non-sugar substance. So we're really actually doing great harm to ourselves when we, uh, when we deprive our brains of glucose and sugar. Oh, definitely. I mean, cortisol is a catabolic hormone. It's very destructive. Uh, it's breaking down muscle tissue. Uh, it's affecting the organs. Uh, it's, it's like making your car run on motor oil rather than on gasoline. And that's what you need to think about. I mean, you know, people feel sluggish and irritable, and that's because you're making your body work off of a source of fuel that it's not set up to work off of. All right, so all this being said, and a lot of information and a lot of big terms here, but what's the takeaway? What, is, what should we be doing uh, correctly, and how do we get that sugar intake down to a reasonable level uh, without it being extreme, something where we can succeed? The main thing is, I think, let's first, let's start off, start out cutting out the sugary drinks. You know, if you're drinking a regular Coke, let's go to a Diet Coke. If you're drinking 10 Cokes a day, let's go to five Diet Cokes a day. And I know that's not popular, and I know a lot of people probably are cringing with that advice. But from my experience, to try to stop cold turkey is just ridiculous. You're not going to be able to do it. So we need to wean ourselves off of that. Then maybe what we might go to is maybe a sugar-free Kool-Aid or something like Crystal Light. Now, a lot of people are probably cringing about that because it has artificial sweeteners. And if you're on the Internet, any time during the day, you're going to see all of these things that claim that artificial sweeteners are causing brain lesions and Alzheimer's. And that's just not true. If it were true, every lawyer would have an ad on TV at night saying, if you drank Crystal Light, give me a call. And they're not doing that because there's no proof at all to show that any of the artificial sweeteners cause cancer or Alzheimer's or ADD. So I would, it's always better to substitute an artificial sweetener than it is for a refined, simple sugar. Uh, so we'll start with the drinks. Uh, with our meals, it's very, very important to make sure that every time we eat a meal, it's composed of a protein, a carbohydrate with small amounts of fat. We need to make sure that the fats are not saturated fat, that they're unsaturated fats. Now you can do that easily by staying away from your fried foods. You know, that's something simple that we can do. I'm not saying don't ever eat fried food again, but I'm just saying try to minimize the amount of fried foods that you're eating. And, and it's baby steps. What happens is once you start minimizing that, you start seeing how much better you feel. You see the weight coming off. You notice your attention span being more crisp and clear, and you can, you can comprehend things better. This is all a matter of our, our nutrition rather than some strange uh, brain disease that we're all developing. And you can see over time as our diets have become poor by eating processed food, so has our brain uh, function. They, they, the brain functioning is going to follow the nutrition. Uh, so that's some of the main things that we can do. Uh, you know, again, uh, you know, if you want a pizza, eat a pizza, but pick a pizza night. You know, hey, let's say that's Saturday night. If you want Mexican food, let's do that Saturday night or Friday night, whatever's more convenient. But let's start to be a little bit more picky about uh, when we do our special treats, when we're going to eat out. I think planning is very important. Uh, with food on every street corner, we've got to where we don't take anything with us because we know we can pull over and grab something. And, you know, you know the old saying, uh, failing to plan is planning to fail. So we've got to plan. We've got to be conscious of what we're doing, be intentional with our, with our food and making an effort to uh, choose to eat healthier things and try to stay away from the processed foods. Tell me where we can find more information about uh, the things that you preach on a, on a regular basis with KH Fitness. Uh, well, I, I've mentioned before that you can go to myplate.gov, which is a great website that gives you a lot of information. You can go on the American Diabetes Association's website. Uh, you know, if you have any information, you could always reach us here at the club and we can, you know, give you some information that we have typed up 
or we can sure point you in the right direction of you know some health professionals that can help you out. And Kelly's website is khfit.com. That, that's where you can find the contact information as well. You, you can do that. If you're on Facebook, you can go to KH Fitness, and it's all one word, and it'll direct you to that, which we try to put a lot of things in um, so that uh, you know we we'll keep people updated on, on, on different uh, meal plans and uh, seasonings, marinades for certain meats, and uh, we just try to always keep that updated so that you'll have something that'll help you out. All right. Kelly Hitchcock, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Brian. I'm Brian Houston. Thanks very much. We'll be talking to you next time.